I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Hey, hey, what's up, world? Welcome back to another edition of I Mix What I Like Live. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Happy to be your host at I Mix What I Like for all of your relevant social media. And please do check out and subscribe to I Mix What I Like dot org. I mix what I like dot org so that you don't miss these and all the other things across a variety of media that I and my uh, colleagues and uh, comrades do. Uh, please again, stay in tune with political prisoners, freedom archives, prisoner report, sign up there for that national Jericho movement, prison org for the latest commentary from people like Mumia Abu Jamal, who's, uh, latest statement on the fear of socialism again, something worthy of uh, hearing and something we should have probably mentioned in the the, the uh, discussion we had earlier today about uh, the uh, real story behind the we are trained Marxist uh, comment from Patrice Cullors and uh, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, uh, hashtag movement, etc. Um, so Please do check out all of that and uh, uh, remain in contact and com conversation with us. And for those who are here now, and I would probably argue for those who check this out later, uh, please do engage the chat and commentary uh, with any comments, questions, queries, conundrums, catechisms, cacophony, calumny, concerns, conundrums, all of that. Uh, but without further ado, I want to turn uh, over to to uh, a conversation with, uh, you know, one of my colleagues in the Black Lash Collective, uh, who many of you uh, would have heard in, in those conversations, if not elsewhere, uh, is a fantastic thinker uh, coming out of all, I think, the African world. Uh, he is, of course, a father. He is a husband. He is a publisher. Uh, working out of Diasporic Africa Press uh, that he founded. He is a professor of Africana Studies at Colgate University uh, and a prolific author, some of which we will be able to talk a little bit about today. And of course, I'm talking about my, my brother and colleague and comrade, Dr. Kwesi Kanadu. Good morning to you, sir, and welcome to the program, to the live stream. Thank you for joining me. Thanks you for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, I want to also say, as I did when we had Rosa Clemente on, that uh, Dr. Conadu also precedes me at the Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell University under the founding directorship of uh, Dr. James Turner, and was also one of the names that I was sometimes positively and sometimes negatively compared to in terms of our affinity uh, for Dr. Turner. So I just want to throw that out there. The, the, the Tiger Cub, the Turner Tiger Cub label could mean a, n a number of different things depending on who was using it. But I wore it proudly and and and, and I'm happy to be in that lineage along with you. But anyway, so I just wanted to add that to, to this, to, to your introduction as well. Um, there's so much that I want to ask you about, and and you you uh, have really been uh, extremely prolific. Uh, starting with what I, if correct me if I'm wrong, was was your first book of you from the East, the uh, black cultural na uh, black cultural nationalism and education in New York City, which was a book that I did read uh, years ago when it came out, and then for some odd and unexplained and inexplicable reason. Uh, failed to pay enough attention and keep up with all of your incredible work until your most recent book, again, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, On Our Own Way in This Part of the World, uh, a biography of an African community, culture, and nation, which is an extension of what is an incredible and increasing body of literature that you have on the African diaspora, in particular, the Akan community. Uh, so my quick and first broad question to you is, is can you, for me and others, sort of draw this link from where you were with the East and where you've gone to, to uh, on our own way uh, and, and a discussion of this brother who, who I, 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 we're going to have to get to in a moment, but I just talk to me a little bit about that, that, that trajectory, so to speak, if you would. Right. Right. Well, it's, I appreciate the question very much. And it's actually less of an arc of a story because um, at 45 years old, I'm actually just getting warmed up. 
And, and Word, so, I see. And so it, it's less of an arc of a story where I can say, well, this led to that one. My path was, was intellectual path anyway, was very much um, circuitous. And so I did begin the view from the East uh, as a master's thesis at the Africana Study Research Center at Cornell, uh, which you shouted out early on, uh, under the advisorship of Dr. James Turner, um, including Dr. Asila Mumba and, and a few other colleagues who were part of my committee. And you're absolutely right. When you were coming in, I was, I think that was my last um, semester. I remember that ride through the town. I think you, you were driving. I didn't have a car then. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, we, we went through the town. We went past uh, a few eateries as you go down the hill in, into the um, I yeah, guess, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we were we were just you know chopping it up, um, talking about different things at, at the moment. And so, you know, that moment at at, at Cornell is what led to um, the you know more or less my thesis was enhanced, was revised. I did some additional research, especially speaking with the women of the East. Um, that allowed me to um, really, really get into some of the questions that I couldn't answer during the thesis phase because it was a short-term project. And so I was able to build on and do some more research that would allow me to do the View from the East. So that book um, in many ways sets up not really an intellectual sort of domino effect that leans into others. Um, basically the recipe for most in academia is this. The dissertation becomes your first book. Your first book is, is basically um, you know, refurbished into the second book because you use the same source material. Hmm. And the third book, if you do one, because the vast majority of academia do not publish. And so most of the publications are about less than 20% of academia are really the ones that publish. About 80 to 75% or 75 to 80% are really um, you know, teachers, people who are in the trenches with that four or five load, uh, which I have carried at some point. I'm sure you have carried at some point. And so all points, that's what? all I've carried. <laughs> you know, only recently I had gotten some reprieve, you know, at my current, you know, um, um, spot. Yeah. But prior to that, it, it's, it's really, uh, that's been the, the, the typical load. So um, what's really been, I think, less therefore of an arc is more has been um, sort of my, my, my premise, which is that unlike that script that comes out of academia, dissertation, the first book, second book, and pretty much you're done. We look forward to retirement and pension. My thing was always, I never want to do the first thing again, right? So um, I, I hate monotony or I have a rejection to monotony or doing the same thing that looks, you know, sort of similar to the next. And so what's characterized each of my projects have been really, um, and, and I sort of take this with a, with a, with a bit of, um, you know, lemon and salt and that it's the first, you know, particular book to do what it does. Right. And so all my books have that feature. So my, the book in the East was the first book uh, on the East organization, um, Uhuru Sasa, and particularly the, the, the theme of, of sort of nationalist ideology um, and worked into the sort of the pragmatics, you know, of a community building. And that was really my concern. How do these community people, um, elders, young people, students, you know, able to work out a formula for um, not only creating a space, but creating really a, a global uh, network of people. And anyone who read the View from the East will, will, will see how this local you know, group of people became global. Um, and then the Nikon Diaspora book, which you're showing um, for those who are joining us live and those who will see this later on, um, the Nikon Diaspora book really flows out of that because you know, one of the areas that the East book covered, including research, was Guyana. Uh, the Republic of Ghana, which actually the Socialist Republic of Ghana, as it were, at the point. And a main character there, actually two of them, was Forbes Burnham, the prime minister, uh, who went to school in London and with the likes of people like Kwame Nkrumah and other, you know, Pan-Africanist thinkers and intellectuals. Um, and um, a person by the name of well, Wiyusi Kiana, um, who was the um, really sort of the um, cultural Pan-Africanist in Guyana in the 1960s and 70s. And so, he and his wife uh, and an organization called Ascria, um, they were the driving forces that actually sort of um, laid out the sort of broader network of people and places that dot, you know, the African world. And so um, that led to other works, including the Condas for Transatlantic Africa. And so all of them have this, this particular feel whereby if you have come across them, you have not come across them before any other formal way. 
And so they, they themselves are the first to do what they try to do um, in, in, in their own way. Um, and so <clears throat> that's one of anything I think has been really the um, hallmark of, of the work um, is really trying to push myself, um, push, you know, whatever feels my work, you know, fits into, but also to really to push, um, you know, ahead the um, knowledge production in the African world, to populate the, that, the African world with these knowledges um, that forms part of a global lore whereby, um, you know, people of the African world um, you know, have and assume their rightful place, you know, in the scheme of knowledge, in the scheme of um, nutritional knowledge that informs, um, you know, human action. And this, this, so this rightful place that you raise is, is, is a perfect segue because in this most recent book, uh, you, well, I'll say, cause I haven't, I haven't finished it and I, and I don't want to pretend to, to fully understand all that you're doing here, but it seems to me that you are through the individual story of one person trying not only to restore him to his rightful place uh, in 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 historical study or knowledge or uh, uh, for, but but his people and in fact the diaspora. Um, so one, I wanted to ask you because I don't, I don't, wanna, I think I'm, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, and, and I don't even know the 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 uh, the the. I'm not even sure I understand the lettering, mm -hmm. but brother Kofi is his first name, Baba Kofi, and mm -hmm. I wanted you to 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 explain both the the pronunciation and the spelling as we read it in the book of his name. Uh, um, but I wanted to start with something that you've written here about. You said you say that. Um, and how might this person made invisible through record keeping and archiving become legible with only a slight documentary trail? How might his life and that of his community and his nation become a useful window to understand culture, health and healing and well known transformations of the, of the 20th century world, such as colonial empire, religious and medical missionaries uh, and nationalist and military governments from everyday human perspectives. That and several other comments and questions you raise, I think, are, are fascinating. But if you would correct me on the pronunciation of his name, and then and, and maybe respond to what I'm I'm raising here that you're you're doing, or I think that you're doing, in restoring all of us in some way to a rightful place through the story of this one man, this one community, this one part of West Africa. Sure thing. So his name is Kofi Donko. And Kofi Donko was a healer, blacksmith, uh, family head, a father, a husband, uh, a trainer uh, of healers, uh, a, recon a reconciliator in terms of, you know, um, settling um, community and other kinds of disputes, uh, marriage counselor, um, psychiatrist, psychologist. Uh, he was a multiverse. Um, but really what my interest here is not really the individual life is really um, all the people that came in contact with him and therefore how his and their life ricochet over each other that produced what I call a people's history, um, a sort of a, a, a sort of a wide angle view at an evolving culture an evolving community and an evolving. <laughs> and not to be confused with Howard Zinn's, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, by, by no means. So I don't right, mean right. that. No, I'm just, I'm just messing with right, you. Right, right, right. <laughs> You know, by people's history, I mean how these lives rub against each other and then create uh, what I'm referring to as intra-African histories. As I'm sure you know, you know, as, as a, uh, a person who has studied history, um, you know, majored in history, <laughs> I've written about Dr. Clark. And so the problem with history as a discipline, as a field, it who it takes as its subjects, right? And the problem is that it takes as its subjects those who have a dense documentary trail. So for instance, I think it's lazy and, and really easy to write the history of a president, of a prime minister, of a person who have left their own personal papers, right? And so when presidents have their presidential libraries at, at their disposal, that me, that's easy, that's not challenging. What I think is more challenging and more rewarding is focusing on everyday peoples who will never have a documentary trail. In fact, the vast majority of us, and this may sound counterintuitive, you know, who live in this 21st century world of data points and large data sets, 
will also never um, be archived in, in, in some you know meaningful way, and therefore will never leave enough fragments to have a reconstructed story possible. That's for the majority of the seven billion people on this planet. And so therefore my challenge to um, people who claim to do history is that what we should focus therefore on are everyday people who don't leave a dense documentary trail, you know, who, who are not uh, and don't expect to be found uh, in the archives. By the way, no one finds complete lies in the archives. I mean, it, it's an idiosyncratic, you know, repository of fragments, right? Uh, that are curated, you know, for particular purposes, including um, you know, booing empire and booing, you know, um, certain people's um, lives against, you know, others. And so uh, I get all that. And so what I found through Kofi Donko and his community and all the people, scholars which were enriched by his knowledge, um, there's a, one particular character out of several in the book, his name is Dennis Warren, a white male from the U.S. who went to the university for his um, doctoral studies, and he studied uh, in the region um, or community of Techiman, where Kofi Donko hails, and uh, he produced this um, very dense dissertation that became essentially the foundation for his admirable academic career. He went on, Dennis Warren that is, went on to receive promotion and tenure, as well as became a UN, um, you know, um, World Bank expert uh, on African affairs, and, and particularly dealing with health and medicine and development. However, if you read the dissertation all throughout, Dennis Warren says clearly that his most important quote unquote informant was Kofi Donko. In fact, even in his articles that came out of dissertation, uh, again, this person had a very uh, remarkable academic career, but I argue in the book that that career is really a footnote to the intellectual uh, history and prowess of Kofi Donko because Dennis Warren says very clearly in his numerous articles that Kofi Donko provided over 2,000 disease lexemate, disease terms and therapeutic uh, options for them, over 2,000. And it was that intellectual content that became the substance of his dissertation, which was then recycled into the articles and the books that became the basis for his academic career. What did Kofi Donko get out of it? Like most Africans, not much, only to be reduced to a research assistant. In fact, when I follow the footnote breadcrumbs you know, in Warren's work, and this, by the way, this story is, is an allegory for, of course, millions of Africans who have been, you know, docketed as research assistants, as interpreters, and as go-betweens and intermediaries for knowledge production, but also the unequitable power relation in the world between Africa and, you know, the world. And so this allegory, you know, uh, between Menace, Dennis Warren and Kofi Donko, you know, really sits well for us to really think about you know, um, decolonization, which of course I push back against in terms of the political uh, consequences of people like Kwame Nkrumah and other nationalist leaders who claim to be Pan-Africanists, but in fact, they reified the colonial structures more so than actually demolished them, which we can talk about a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, that's on my list because <laughs> you, when, uh, I forgot when it was when you, um, uh, when we were when we last met, I think we were I think it was at Colgate and you said I think we were in your office and you said yeah. something about you have a, a, a different opinion or view. Right. Uh, I want to get to that. Um, but I but I first wanted to just uh, th this one because you, you say here that uh, yet Kofi Donko suffered an all too common fate. The exploitation of his labor and product by cocoa brokers during the boom years and that of th this intellectual history. Uh, and vast healing knowledge during the coming of age for Ghana and African studies in the 1960s and 70s. So you you do clear. I mean, just as you said, you clarify uh, that you're you're using this or making this as an allegory or an allegorical point to to reference a broader relationship that is uh, uh, occurring and ongoing, um, which I find and am finding as I continue to read the book very compelling as an approach. But you also talk in the process, you know, when we were talking, uh, uh, um, you know, I talked about when I talked to uh, uh, Brother Keto Swan the other day about his new book, you know, I'm reminded of some of, of what I felt in, in, in reading his and reading yours. When you talk about the, 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 I think you said you went every year to Ghana from 2001 to 2014. You said you talk about that you, you while there you refused to speak English so that you could better master uh, Twi. If I'm even, I don't even think I'm, I never think I'm pronouncing that right when I say it. Mm. But uh, so I wanted to talk about this this importance of not only the method and the time and the commitment 
Uh, but even specifically this issue of language, you know, for those of us who are woefully mono or maybe slightly um, multilingual in, in, or, or, or bilingual, um, what role does this language play, particularly of African languages? I don't speak any uh, and, and yet have, have claimed to be playing some participatory role in Africana studies, you know, for, for some, what role does specifically language play? But then also, if you would talk a little bit more about your method uh, in putting this work together, that I think is really important and fascinating. Sure thing. Appreciate that. And, and shout out to Brother Keto Swan, uh, who is a mutual colleague of ours. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, that, that book of his uh, is, is really tremendous work um, because it's the kind of research that is um, both necessary and, and nutritious, you know, once once folks have a chance to digest it fully. And so in similar vein, um, you know, it was not simply just Ghana, but um, really, you know, most of the sources are, again, supplied by Europeans, documentary sources, which I push back against by saying that documents should not, should not be either deified nor should they become the starting point of a, of a history, of a story. Uh, they're simply one data point, one kind of data point. And so, um, as much as, as, as language certainly is important for um, doing this kind of work, and I'm sure Keto can testify to that, is that um, for me, the language is a gateway into appreciating the culture. And I like to think of it this way. There are historians who are also lawyers or historians who are also um, MDs, uh, who, are, who are formerly MDs and, and, and doing historical work. And what it does, it provides them, for example, in people doing legal history, it provides them with a layer um, a, a perspective um, and, and a language, right? To be able to untangle case file, for example, people dealing with legal history, or in the case of medical medical history, those people who have training either in public health or, or as let's say physicians, they are able to understand epidemiology. They able to understand, you know, um, disease morphology. They understand, you know, some of the finer points for which others who are without that kind of schooling um, are less intelligible. And so. I think language does the same thing, but it does it to culture, right? Uh, because we live in and through culture, uh, this vector, this, this sort of force field that's, that's always ever present. And so it allows me to pierce through some of the layers of culture and be able to really just appreciate what I think sometimes either goes unnoticed or undetected by those who would rather use in, you know, interpreters or rather use um, secondary sources or, or neither. I think most people who claim to do you know, so-called diaspora history they're really, um, what they produce is really a, a criminal act and a fraud because um, they don't engage Africa, meaning on the ground, meaning touching their feet on African soil. And if they do, it's through these intermediaries, these brokers, these filters, and they have no way of checking. Because I mean, my first time, um, you know, when I was in Ghana, you know, I had certainly, I worked with, you know, a, a friend who uh, interpreted for me, but I was learning in so much of the language that one time I paused and I said, no, 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 that's not what she said. And he was shocked. He was surprised, <laughs> you know? And from that point on, our collaborative work together really changed because he realized he could not simply, you know, give me a, 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 a you know, a, a very uh, parochial version of whatever he think I wanted to hear, right? <laughs> and of course, this has allegory for how we deal with knowledge, how we deal with politics, you know, even our intimate relationships when we have these, you know, sort of, um, you know, dialogues of the deaf, you know, we're really we're listening, but we can't hear, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we see, but we, but we really can't see. And so the language allows me to see uh, and hear differently, not better, not worse, but just to hear and see differently. And I think to get close to the texture of the people for me, that's important, which are the people on the ground. And for, for, for the historical work, you know, on the ground means 18th century, 16th century, and therefore, I'm I'm using these filters to be able to make sense of what other people either blow by because they don't understand it uh, and therefore dismiss it, or they, they see but can't make sense of it, right? Uh, the language allows me to do all that kind of work as another layer. Um, and so that's it for, for the, the language part. Uh, and I, I would say this too for European languages, those are also crucial because as I said a moment ago, many of the documentary uh, records are in European language. So, you know, um, I read and, and speak Portuguese. You know, I read French. I read Spanish. Uh, I can survive speaking it. And, um, you know, and I work with a dictionary with Dutch and other languages, you know, to make myself through. Because here's really the point of it all. The point of it all is that I never want 
to have a filtered interpretation for my own, right? That's why I'm old school when it comes to research. Uh, and this is your question of methods. Um, I, I have these black and white composition books I've had since Cornell. <laughs> I even have my notebooks from Cornell um, th those days. And I do all my analysis by hand. You know, all my interviews I transcribe and I do it by hand. I do my coding by hand. I analyze by hand because I don't want to put my interpretive, my brain work, my cognitive work, you know, in the hands of a software. I just don't. And so, um, you know, I'm old school that way. And, and, you know, I'll live with the results because I know it's mine. Right. And, um, you know, there's scholars who or people who claim to be scholars who, you know, do this sort of, you know, touristic, you know, approach where they might visit a place. They spend a week or two. And then they're writing an entire book about it, you know. Um, or well, hold on, and I, forgive the interruption, but I have, I, I, you know, but there's the famous one of my favorite moments is when Mary Lefkowitz on stage with Guy Rogers and Martin Bernal and, of course, Dr. Clark, while she's telling everybody who's authentically writing about Africa, says, I've never been to the continent. Mm -hmm. She hadn't even been to the continent. So you, you, she didn't even do the tourism thing <laughs> and made a whole career uh de de defining mm -hmm. what is uh, uh african history and, and it's it's mm -hmm. role in the world anyway so i'm i'm sorry go ahead yeah yeah so now it's it's not a prerequisite but if that's the case and that's true for all the studies you know people can't claim to be uh, experts of french history and not have been to france nor speak french right in africa you can get away with that and of course that's the sort of um you know not even on equal but but but, but that's a disturbed power relation between africa and the world through which you know knowledge is sort of you know hurried through which we can talk about that a little more. So the methods, you know, in terms of what I'm using in this book and I try to use throughout the other works is really an approach called communiography. Uh, again, the idea is that I'm not concerned with the individual life story, but how these ricochet and, and reflect against other lives, because that's really how human, you know, um, you know, lives really exist. You know, no one of us, no, none of us, excuse me, really have, you know, our lives worked out in a vacuum or within a silo of, of select people. Now we can choose who we call, we can choose who we respond to, but we can't choose who we encounter, right? And those sort of chance encounters are really what makes a human life because those chance encounter, uh, for me with Dr. Turner, you know, one of the best things happened to my intellectual life. And so those chance encounters, you know, is really what makes us as human beings, it really what's, what, what feeds us is really what makes us whole um, and, and therefore fill out in terms of our place in this, you know, human constructed world and to an extent anyway. And that's really my interest. It's sort of the broad ricocheting, you know, after effects, the tremors, right, of these of these collisions uh, is really what I want to get to. And these are the people for me that are most important because they're on the ground, you know, their optics, their sense of the world is really what I'm after. And in doing so, um, I pay attention to these, you know, um, you know, nuances that I think helps me to uh, hopefully represent them in a way that they can understand. Uh, and this I made clear in the introduction to the book, which which you probably have passed by now, which is that I want Kofi Donko or any people that I've had the honor to work with um, to see themselves in what I've written. If they can't see themselves in what I've written, then I haven't written their story. Mm. Well, I, you know, what, yeah, anyway, I, I, I can only imagine that I would have to expect that all involved feel very good or have felt very good about the work. Uh, because whatever you could, whatever anyone might say, you didn't get perfectly right would have to be seen as, you know, he made his best effort. I mean, you can't you can't knock the effort, at least. I don't know what the critique would be. I'm just saying mm -hmm. uh, if there is. I, I did want to make a note. I mean, I appreciate your gracious response on the linguistic piece, because some years ago I had the pleasure of um, running into uh, who is now the late uh, uh, James Spady mm -hmm. and uh, uh, who's first of all, whose work on hip hop he did to hip hop history what you've done for for Kofi Donko and and uh, Akan history I think his work in terms of getting down to the grassroots to the community to the language to the way language is used he did that work I think as well if not better than most who say they did hip hop history but he tightened me up he was not happy to have heard that I did uh, my my master's thesis on Dr Clark hmm. Uh, largely, and, and he started his criticism of because I uh, am monolinguistic, mm. monolingual, that he said you, you didn't read, the, you don't read the French journals, you don't read the Arabic language journals uh, discussing not only uh, uh, Clark's involvement in the African world, but particularly his relationship with Czech and yeah. which Spady said I and most have no proper understanding of. Mm. Um, 
And I've never forgotten that encounter. We could never build on it and get more clarity on it, but I always appreciate it. I mean, I, I had to, I, there was nothing I could say other than you're right. Uh, you know, um, even as he was far, I say, I should say, less gracious than you've been in, 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 in raising that that point. So I, but I, so I just wanted to recognize the importance of that. So, so as quickly as possible, because I do want to get to, to as many other things as we can. But I did want you to say a word or two because a lot of your work does focus on uh, uh, the Akan people, um, and I wanted you to talk about the the importance of of Akan to diaspora, and then the importance of diaspora to African people, mm -hmm. if you would. Sure thing. So, uh, in fact, quite a bit of the work so far have focused on the uh, Akan peoples. And there's a reason for that. Um, that's my entryway. And so um, the Akan tree language, uh, which I speak, is simply an entryway into other African languages or other knowledge systems that are tethered to culture and, and language. And so that's my entry point. That's my platform. That's my jumping off point. And so basically, if, if, if you sort of imagine, you know, the former Gold Coast, present day Ghana being sort of a staging point is where I can look out onto the world. Right. Uh, and, and then and then make the kinds of connections um, and make the kinds of you know notations uh, as far as I can see from that platform. And so it's really really a staging post, but it's not been the most important one or the only one. So uh, we can talk, we can talk about this later. But you know, for example, people who um, would think that I only do a con history or, or deal with a con culture. Um, you know, I did transatlantic Africa, which which, which is really uh, sort of a global history that unites. You know how people think about um, you know Atlantic history, Indian Ocean history, even the Mediterranean, uh, and bringing them all together to retell the story of slavery, um, capitalism, the birth of capitalism, uh, and of course the modern world uh, through African you know voices. Meaning, uh, speaking of multilingual, um, you know the 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 the. the, the the sources, you know, for that particular book, just by way of example, um, they were in Portuguese, they were in Arabic, which I don't read Arabic, but I read French. So I, these were the translations of a translation. And as, as probably know, most of the Arabic um, sources um, that concerns African history, at least, um, have either been translated into French, you know, or have a French edition, uh, only because the French were the major colonists in North Africa. Um, and therefore that became sort of a, a, a bridge, you know, to, you know, Arabic language, you know, sources. And so um, the sources that I used were Portuguese, um, you know, Arabic through French, French, you know, German, um, Dutch, um, English. And uh, there were actually, I think, one or two that had African language content that I was able to work through, Kiswahili in particular, which I, by the way, I studied at Cornell with Professor Abdul Nanji. Shout out to Mualimu Nanji. Yeah, big shout out uh, to him. Uh, and so in working with the multilingual sources, my key thing was there that there are plenty of books, in fact, thousands of books about transatlantic slaving, but none have done this through the people who experienced it. Isn't that something? And so that was the first book to do that, to really take, you know, to say, hey, I'm tired of the hearsay voices, the people that are living their upper middle class, comfortable lives, talking about what enslaved people did and didn't do and could and couldn't do. I want to hear from the people who, in fact, have left some record, um, whether through dictation or through uh, various kinds of fragmentary accounts, uh, interviews, and other kinds of records. And so, in doing so, you know, it was this was not an account project. Is, is really my point, but it was more so again using what I had learned, you know, by working from the Gold Coast Ghana, by working from that platform, I was able to see that okay, there is, is another set of you know body of stories waiting out there to be told, right? Um, and that so it gave me the sort of entryway, you know, to that because actually that book began as a book chapter that I did for a colleague of mine's uh, using the sort of a con Gold Coast material. Um, and then, of course, I was able to, you know, extend out uh, further, uh, looking at Brazil, at Cuba, but also South Africa, Madagascar, Indian Ocean, uh, Mediterranean, and of course, the Atlantic part, the U.S., Canada, and, and the like. Um, so that kind of work came out of from that particular platform. And then in terms of the Akan history, I want to make it pretty clear that Akan is not an ethnic term, uh, as some people like us to believe. It's actually a, a sort of a, a meta term. It's, it's synonymous with 
um, first nation in terms of the peoples who indigenous to this land, meaning that there's no you know particular eth ethno-linguistic connotation to the term. It simply means that these are people who claim to be Arachans, who claim to be indigenous, who make certain indigenous claims to land. And so um, the word Akan comes from the root word in, in Chi, Kang, which means first, foremost, pioneer, right? So these are first pioneering people um, that share a calendar, um, certain cultural uh, features in terms of political organization, you know, um, social formation, uh, kinship relationships, language, um, and, and spiritual culture, and, and so on and so forth. And so those shared materials um, then became the, the sort of the, the, the bedrock for my, my grounding. And I have to admit and, and make it clear to those who, who are with us now and, and who join us later is that my you know, affinity to working or you know, sort of being chosen and choosing to work from this Gold Coast uh, Akan um, Ghana platform is informed very much by my family and ancestry. So my folks are, you know, I was born in Jamaica, the island of Jamaica, rather than Jamaica, Queens. I was born in island of Jamaica. And my, my folks are from there. My great, great grandmother um, and her mother were Maroons who were from the community called Akompong, which is on the Western part of the island in Paris of St. Elizabeth. And those Maroon people in actually, you know, doing this work when I was a 17, 18 year old. In fact, I cut my teeth, you know, as this, you know, working on African world histories through doing a family history project when I was 17, 18. That's what I first started um, on my own, you know, just, you know, moved by my own uh, ancestry, I guess, spirit. And it was from that kind of underground interviewing, recording in a compound that, that led me to Ghana. And um, the short story is after, in, in, in the midst of doing that kind of groundwork, with, with the elders there in Jamaica, particularly in the Kampong and elsewhere, is when I had this dream to say that if you wanna know more about your great, great grandmother, you have to go to Ghana. And that's what I did. <laughs> and, and literally wow. the rest of history. <laughs> um, wow. You know, in fact, it, it, uh, uh, I was looking, you, you said, uh, there's so much, man, there's so many different tributaries, but you said something that reminded me of something that I had highlighted in your book where you said that uh, that humanity is divided into quote unquote races is the, ge uh, the, wait, that humanity is divided into quote unquote races, the geography of the world into continents and nation states and historical time into moments dubbed quote unquote pre-colonial or post-colonial is commonplace. But if we filter these conceptual divisions, the ideas and experiences of historical subjects such, such as Kofi Donko, they might amount to semantic nonsense. Uh, and it, it sounds almost like you were just elaborating on that point just a moment ago, but I wanted to make sure that, that if you weren't, that you would, um, uh, before I ask you this question about Nkrumah, and then we'll go to, to, to the chat and for some comments and questions that I think that uh, are, are being raised there that I think will um, help expand the conversation as well. But anyway, but but semantically, linguistically, labeling wise, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, did I understand your point in, in terms of its connection to what you were just saying um, uh, as, as being at least um, what you were just explaining and, and obviously as part of your the importance of your work in general? Sure thing. So, the, I mean, th that statement you you read, um, which I wrote, <laughs> uh, what was was simply saying that um, most of these 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 um, you know imaginary artificial divisions, not just divisions, but but categories, they really amount to this sort of semantic fog that we're walking through. Um, that is, they've had no real you know, sort of you know um, human. <laughs> they, they have no real you know sort of human um, you know feel and touch to it. In other words, th there's no more real and therefore useful, uh, such as you know th 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 their their contemporary you know um, counterparts and kindred, terms like anti-racist, you know white supremacy, you know these things are empty categories that have no real meaning uh, in terms of how people experience you know the things that they they call to attention, right? So the thing they call attention is real, but the categories themselves are empty, and as such, you know we know that continents are fake. You know no one names a continent. No one has a continental view. No one experiences the United States, you know, as as, as a so-called, you know, subcontinent, right? Uh, all our experiences are local, right? Um, in fact, my wife and I were chatting yesterday, and I was just sharing with her that, you know, you know, as long as we've been here in Brooklyn, New York, most of our, you know, the hours of our lives are spent here in Brooklyn, right? 
Uh, and that's 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 not you know that's true for most people in the world. You know, our lives are transacted locally, and that's why you know my my optics, my senses are always to the ground see, in terms of what's happening to people on the ground um, to get sort of the texture of their lives. And so, Kofi Donko puts these categories really. Uh, into clearer focus um, and sees them for what they are, really these empty shells. You know, for example, if we, we know that African history has been parceled out into pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial, but that's that kind of script, you know, that that, that kind of um, you know, script is authored by empire, British Empire in particular. And so, you know, what his life shows is that the sort of rupture that people, you know, in the academy, particularly so-called Africans, tend to cling to, is that the pre there was something called pre-colonial and that the colonial moment ruptured, you know, whatever African past people had their connections to. And therefore that rupturing, you know, created this, these new kinds of post-colonial Africa beings. And all that's really foolishness. You know, as you make your way through the book, what you will see is that, you know, Kofi Donko's community um, and peoples who came in contact with him from in and around the wide radius in which, you know, his healing prowess casted, um, you know, they were, you know, not... I'm not saying they were not affected, but they were largely unaffected by these the way these categorical um, statements are levied upon them. Um, yes, people did feel, and certainly you know, the brunt of colonial rule, uh, but not to the extent and not in the way that people have have made it out to be and made careers out of so far, uh, because in these intra-African moments, that is these histories that are being made without a European interloper, without a European you know eyewitness. Um, these stories, you know, give you a different, you know, uh, perspective, you know, on you know, these peoples and other people like them within the African continent that essentially amounts to this, you know, which can be a segue perhaps to Nkrumah, which is that at the time of independence, so-called political independence in March 1957, when the Gold Coast became the Republic of Ghana, um, the resume or profile for the vast majority of peoples in that territory, the tripartite colony, as I call it, were A, farmers, B, illiterate in European languages, but literate in their own languages and, and cultural forms, and C, non-Christian and non-Muslim. That was the profile. That was the demographic resume. However, those, those you know, so-called big six, Nkrumah and others uh, who, were, who were the so-called architects uh, of crafting the new nation state, um, they reneged you know, on that profile and, and they began to look elsewhere for instance, you know, they looked at the United States. Of course, Nkrumah spent time um, here in the States at um, Lincoln University. Nandi Ezekiel of Nigeria did the same thing, and then a host of others as well, uh, before he, Huey Nkrumah moved on to London. Never finished in his doctorate, his doctorate there, but he came back into Gold Coast uh, sort of agitation and labor union politics. But you know, the United States never left him in terms of what he saw, and Nkrumah wrote this in, in his, his writings that as an archetype. And what I argue in the book is that, you know, the United States was already a failed state in terms of being riddled by all these isms, capitalism, classism, sexism, and so on. So why would you use a failed archetype as your model for the new nation? And again, Nkuma is not alone. If you look across the African continent, all these so-called nationalists, uh, quasi-pan-Africanists, um, you know, uh, can't say leaders, but, but really political figures um, really reneged on the profile of their peoples. Right. And I argue that Kofi Donko offered this sort of non-national decolonized approach to community that, you know, could have and should have been part of the you know, sort of plebiscite or debate about what the nation should be. All right. So that's perfect. So let's 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 talk about that for a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> unpack that a little bit. What was at least in terms of the ideas represented in, in, in Kofi Donko, what what is what was he or what are those ideas proposing? Mm -hmm. What was Nkrumah proposing? Uh, you know, what, what were the differences? Because when people like me, of course, you know, uh, come inexpertly or from a different perspective and we read Nkrumah uh, or, 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 you know, some of the histories of, of, of that struggle, I'm saying this is the guy. Like this is as much or as much the guy or part of the women and men we should be referring to. Mm -hmm. You know, with his critique of imperialism and 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 the goals of the United States of Africa and this pan-African vision under so scientific socialism. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, man, this is what's up. Like, let's go. You know, let's I read his guerrilla warfare manuals and I'm excited. Just say <laughs> that. You know, like I, you know, like I mean, I mean, so so 
so, so what is, what's what's what are we missing? What's happening? Okay, uh, I hope you have me back on because this this is this, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, this, this, hey. this, this is the more protracted but necessary. I you know discussion to have. Excuse yeah. me, you were going to say something. I was just going to say excited. I'm just getting amped up. I was going to say <laughs> we don't we have sure? a particular limit today. <laughs> yeah, and and w w this we will definitely have yeah. as many more of these as 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 you can squeeze into your schedule. But yes, yeah. Anyway, uh, man, for these uh, I'm always open. Um, and, and so if you and, and your um, the folks that ride with you will have me on, then then I, I'm, I'm with it. So. Um, I'll, I'll say this to, to sort of um, you know, add some fire to the log, right? To, to get this um, this warmed up. There's a there's, there's a there's a and, I, and I poke at it in the book, but I don't get into it because it, it, it takes me away from what I want to do. But I poke at this idea that not all, but many of the majority, vast majority of the uh, African nationalists and, and some in some cases quasi pan Africanists. Um, political figures that we have come to um, revere, um, in fact, turn out to be statesmen that that worked against the very ideals in which they um, champion in writing and, 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 in, and in rhetoric. That's my opening argument. Um, so, um, or as people, Bob Brown says, yeah. you are taking a shotgun to some ideas here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that, that's my that's my opening opening argument. Um, you know, for it should be a long case, you know, OJ Simpson style case, you know. Um well come on, Johnny Cochran. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lay it out, because if the glove don't fit, yeah, come doesn't. on. I'm just there's so many yeah. puns and jokes, but go ahead. <laughs> It doesn't, you know. Um, the glove that we assign to these people uh, is, is is a misfit. I, I mean that in two in double entendre, two meanings. Um, and so, people like Nkrumah, who I do respect and I, and whose work I do um, put into context, I've written about Nkrumah in other places. Um, um, people that we hail, you know, like Secretary. Um, um, you know, I've gotten to fights in Jamaica, not physical fight, but it almost got there. Yeah, I was about with, to say you might have been for real, like, yeah. with, with, with with a group of rosters, you know, who who uh, I began to clarify. Here's Selassie, the the real person, not, not the idea of Hale Selassie. Ooh. So um, so I, I'm not afraid to do any of these because you know my my, my um, you know the, the pillow that I rest on is, is the historical evidence, and and I'm always comfortable in that. <laughs> um, so people, you know, in Kuma in particular, but people that of that ilk. Um, you know, we can deal with Humphrey Bonnet of Cote d'Ivoire, um, Keita of, of Mali, uh, or Secretary of Guinea. Um, even some of that, I, I hail, you know, very high remarks for um, um, Judas and Um We can go down the line, you know, that, that a number, quite, a, even not in Zikwe, that these flawed archetypes have been celebrated. And, I, and I'm, I'm saying their celebration should be tempered. Um, you know, r rather than a resounding victory, uh, it, it, it should be sort of a quiet descent. <laughs> um, because what I'm arguing is that the people that we've been led to celebrate, and in some cases we've been we've been seduced to celebrate, are not the people we should be. We should be celebrating everyday, ordinary people like a Kofi Donko, because they are more like us, and that's how you conceptually decolonize the sort of waiting for a savior, waiting for an intellect, waiting for a um, principal figure to be the rescuer in your story. It's typical Hollywood archetype, right? You're waiting for a hero. For example, in the movie Hotel Rwanda, if you juxtapose that to what I like is Sometime in April by Raoul Peck, the brother from Haiti, right? You juxtapose those two, what you see is that there were no heroes, right? So what we've been seduced by is the Hollywood script making uh, of, of hero uh, making and worshiping. And so we have to have a hero. So Nkuma fills, you know, essentially a slot that anyone else could have filled. Um, it's not about Nkuma is what my point is. It's about the script. It's about the, it's about the archetyping of the kinds of people that we're led to. And we can add Martin Luther King Jr. We can add Gandhi and all the other people to that particular script. It doesn't matter really who the person is. So again, it's not personal. It's the script making. It's sort of the, 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 um, the, the script making that creates a narration that we become seduced to. And in that narration, we find ourselves in this sort of narrative loop, 
right? Expecting another one. Where's next Nkuma? Where's the next Garvey? When's the next Malcolm, right? And I'm saying, you know, that 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 is that is a flawed feedback loop. The way we break out of that, I think, is to look at, you know, the 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 you know the the extraordinary in the ordinary and celebrate the ordinary, celebrate the children, celebrate the mothers who are mothers, celebrate the fathers who are fathers. And I think by doing so, what you get is not only a people's history in terms of knowledge production, you get a people's politics that's really about the people. Most people claim the people, this abstract mass of, of, of subjects, but never really define who are the people, right? Like you hear it all, you know, all the time, every day, you know, on these various media, which I won't name because I want to give them any you know, spotlight, but you know who they are. Uh, and they're always saying this is for the American people, right? This is for the people. Um, political organizations, and I won't name them, but you know who they are, would say power to the people. This is all for the people. People always claim the people, but never really say who these people are. And I want to know who they are. We need to know who they are. But we can't because we're in this feedback loop provided by the script of imperialism and empire that, you know, we, we, we by you know, necessity, search out for a, for a leader, for a political figure to save us in some way, to provide the script, to provide solutions um, that leads us, you know, in, this, in that loop of, of always being awry. That's why we keep asking the same questions. So, so but for somebody, so, so for somebody like me who is saying, um, at least I don't feel like I'm venerating Nkrumah because of I'm looking for one and I'm venerating someone who had been, for whatever various reasons, um, put in position of leadership and who represented a, ser a set of ideas that I think are of tremendous value. So mm -hmm. um, what would, again, what would we specifically, like what would we learn from the example of, of Confidonko or other people, so to speak, in terms of how this imperial this 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 imperial project of Ghana responds to to a desire for freedom among the people redefined and housed in that geopolitical entity. So, in other words, you know, how where does the Pan Africanism come from? Where you know the, the support for armed struggle in other parts of the continent, and you know what what would what would have been done differently or should have been done differently or could still be done differently? Sure. So um, first things first, uh, think about Napoleon, right? We know about Napoleon Bonaparte, right? The, 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 this general that, that, that um, you know, people within and outside of France um, hail. Um, Napoleon did this, like all political figures who seek political power do. They, 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 they ride the wave of popular sentiment they configure that popular sentiment into sort of a nationalist-like or nationalist movement. And they convert that sentiment um, into a certain kind of politics, electoral politics, or in this case, you know, anti-colonial politics. Then they become the spokesperson of those sentiments for the people. But they never created the sentiment. They were never the source of the sentiment. They were simply the, 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 the sort of, you know, tagging the sentiment. Like we played the game of tag when we were children, right? They tag the sentiment. Uh, they you configure it. Uh, they formulate it into certain slogan airings, right? And then they, they, they assume, you know, some political office. That's what Napoleon did during the French Revolution. And when he became, you know, the, the ruler of France and, and then emperor, what did he do? He became the very same despot that he argued against in his sloganary and 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 in the sort of pre sort of nationalist moment. And Kuma became the same despot, if not worse, as the British colonists who occupied the same seat of power that he did. In Kuma locked, in Kuma locked up in prison, his own political allies and associates, JP Dunkwa, died in detention. JP Dunkwa was part of the, you know, was part of that, you know, um Gold Coast. Um, political agitation that brought Nkuma in when he was in London. Mm. Taught him about party politics. And in fact, J.B. Donko is the one who provided the name Ghana for the new nation. J.B. Donko died in detention at Nkuma's hands. Nkuma, in terms of, you know, connecting to Kofi Donko as a, as a little bridge, he didn't, he didn't dissolve the Cocoa Board, which was the main engine for the colonial government because Coco really, you know, buoyed the colony. 
as you know, Ghana was a royal producer in cocoa up until Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire surpassed them recently, I think 1990s or so. But up until then, the Ghana was a world leader, a world leader in cocoa. And certainly during the, the so-called colonial period. Rather than abolish that and therefore the way the cocoa boom worked, because this, this was an intro institution that made the cocoa and therefore the colonial economy operative, he reified it. He strengthened the long party lines, ideological lines, and essentially farmers got the short end of the stick, the people who put him in that, that position. And so this and other, and there's a trail, there's a sort of a trail mix of other incidents that I lay out in the book. Um, this was a missed opportunity, a real, de a real decolonization, because what Nkrumah and Napoleon and others share in common is a very common fate. And we can apply this, for example, to Donald Trump and Barack Obama. Right, they capture so-called on the ground sentiments. In fact, Malcolm talked about this. Remember that in analyzing the march to Washington. That speech is classic for a number of reasons, but that speech fits perfectly here. How these people, in this case, the other big six, right, Abernathy, King, and Roy Ennis, and others, right, you know, essentially tag popular sentiment. You know, they were foisted up into leadership position. No different. So this is a tried and true script that works, and we can talk about this in the Q and A. Or, so, or, but, or, but, but, but. Man, I, I admit I'm struggling. I, I struggle with this critique, and I've heard it before about Don Qua and other things that that, that Nkrumah is, 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 did. But but part of the reason why I struggle with this is that 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 how else do you, in the context of that quote unquote decolonizing moment, how else do people do this? I mean, we've heard similar critiques of Castro, mm -hmm. of others, but but. But if, and honestly, you can you clarify here. I don't I don't remember the details of what 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 uh, um, uh, Nkrumah was saying that Don Qua represented and why he he did all of that. But but if if you are trying to um, lead a, a, a revolutionary movement and there are elements within the community that are trying to resist that or or are seen as playing a um, a, a neo colonial role, what else are you going to do? And then and then and then how could, for instance, how could uh, a, a, a Kofi Donko led movement to to get rid of the of the cocoa board have occurred without the kind of assumption of political power that Nkrumah was trying to accomplish and then wield, mm -hmm. obviously imperfectly. If if any of that makes sense, Go ahead. it does. In fact, there's I'll, I'll parse that into a few questions um, packed in, into what you just said. So I'll start with cocoa. So before the cocoa board, what most people did would have these cooperators. And in fact, Nkrumah's regime later in his, it did use these cooperative, but what they did, what Nkrumah did, that I talk about in the book, um, you know, he he politicized it along party lines. So there was already indigenous local forms of cooperation uh, among farmers, um, sort of like the model that essentially came out of Ghana called Susu, which in Jamaica and the Caribbean known as Susu or partner, right? These sort of cooperative economic. Um, you know, sort of Kujijakalia type of, of or, or Ujima actually type of formations. Those were already in ground and inbred among the people that was already in place. In fact, that's how cocoa was actually you know, grown, harvest, dried and brought to market. And the, the benefits were shared. In fact, as a side note, you know, if you want to think about cooperative, you know, and cooperations that have worked in terms of a major, you know, world commodity like um, cocoa or coffee, um, think about the work that David um, Robinson, not the basketball player, but Jackie Robinson's son, who has been in Tanzania since the 60s and 70s. He has, he worked with and still works with these um, coffee growers in Tanzania, and they get a better price, keyword, relatively better price in the world market uh, because they're organizing cooperatives. So we know these, these indigenous forms of cooperative economics actually do work, and that was the case on the ground. Again, what Nkrumah, the regime did was politicize that along party lines and essentially, um, you know, sort of reified the authority of certain what are called big men. These 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 men that have political weight uh, or, you know, they have its proximity to people in political power and are able to basically um, squeeze the most profits out of these small scale farmers that they can. And so people began to what? Push back against that. So there were already structures in, in, on, the, on the ground in place to make cocoa work for the majority of the people, right? And therefore to determine a higher price without the intervention of the cocoa board. So essentially, Nkrumah turned the cocoa board against the people, right? Um, rather than actually use it as an instrument, um, either abolishing it or 
tapping into the already cooperatives around cocoa that people already had in place that would have provided for a more equitable distribution of the of the profits that came from cocoa because again think about this ghana you know new republic and even the gold coast was a world leader in cocoa at some point producing 40 percent of the world cocoa and so um that and Kofi Donko and his family were of cocoa farmers, right? So that was in many ways a structure that was on the ground already operative that could have worked. Now, the other question in terms of, you know, could there have been other ways? Of course. Um, think about think about this. Lumumba didn't live long enough, and he wouldn't have lived long enough, but his trajectory su suggests where you know folks could have gone. Remember, Lumumba was a bear. A distributor and seller on the outskirts, you know, of the capital, um, you know, of DRC, the Contemporary Democratic Republic of Congo, um, outside of Kinshasa, and that's how he got to know the people by literally on foot, on bike, on dirt roads, you know, connecting, working with the people, not by sloganeering, not by campaigning. That came later, right? And so. Lumumba personifies really, you know, sort of the underground people, literally a man of the people in Chinua Achebe's, you know, um, phrasing. Um, that came, I think, the closest to approximating um, the pulse and, and the sensibilities and the needs of the people on the ground. Um, now, of course, Nkrumah ironically, you know, sent troops to the Congo, but guess what happened? They never worked. You know why they didn't work? Because, you know, who Nkrumah put in command of the forces on the ground? They were basically, you know, eyewitnesses. They didn't intervene. And in fact, Lumumba lamented this. He said, look, they came, the troops came, you know, that the dispatch by Nkrumah. Um, you know, Nkrumah's people are saying, again, who he put in charge, who he put in charge, but not simply Africans, right, of that command. Africans were the troop, but in terms of the command, they were not simply Africans. And so who he put in charge says much about, you know, his political priorities and his acumen in terms of these situations. So. The troops get there and they're watching the Belgians, they're watching the UN, they're watching the FBI, they're watching the US you know, personnel there. And they're basically lame ducks, they're sitting ducks, just watching because they don't know who's command or who's in control because all these different pieces, right, are, are, in, are in contest. And so um, essentially they are unfortunate eyewitnesses to Lumumba's, you know, you know, Fox trial and murder. And Lumumba laments this. Lumumba says that, you know, you know, when this true, he couldn't get the help that he wanted, right? And you know Lumumba was at that All African People's Congress, right, in, in a crowd that Nkrumah had organized. And again, so Nkrumah taught this particular rhetoric, but when it came down to actual action on the ground, you know, um, many of them went awry, including, for example, giving all that money to, to Secretary Ray, hoping to bring him in. Secretary Ray didn't care about no United you know, States of Africa. He took the money, but he didn't care about those things, right? Um, same so, thing with Peter of Mali. I'll, I'll, I'll pour it. <laughs> no, no, I just wanna, one, I wanna just again acknowledge Baba Porter here, uh, and, I, and I agree, folk tales is true uh, and righteous basis for history is cute, but does not help the cause of liberation of African people. I agree with that. But but this question here sort of gets to or statement here kind of gets to 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 where I start to get defensive, admittedly, about about Nkrumah and others. So so um, when so to your point, Lumumba is not able to to live out his vision, uh, and Nkrumah's vision, however flawed it may be, is is in the con taking place in the context of of the West and the United States plotting. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, interventions, assassination attempts, all kinds of, you know, there is this context. It's not as if people are just in this vacuum and able to, um, but, but, so that's one thing, but, but I want to, I want to uh, privilege our colleague in the, in Black Lash, um, in the, in the Black Lash Africana Collective, which we encourage people to check out when we resume next month. And I want to thank again, Dr. Conadu and everybody in that collective allowing me to have these discussions with each one of them individually in the interim. But Dr. Freya Watt, uh, who just graced us a few days ago, says, interesting analysis on Nkrumah. While I agree with your analysis with not focusing on all of our efforts on one man or woman, can you discuss the geopolitics and national politics of these claims you're making against Nkrumah? And I'm assuming it's similar to what I'm raising. There is this context of the West uh, um, 
give you a chance if you would to, to say anything about that uh, to flesh this out some more. Sure thing. Um, so here, here's something that that may defy the, the, the sort of the gravity of people's thinking when, when we when we can, when we consider these individuals who we have had a certain um, affinity for, right? Uh, it's sort of some for some people these kinds of um, discussions are prohibitive, meaning that. You can't talk bad about Malcolm. You can't talk bad about this. But first of all, let me be very clear. Uh, I'm not talking bad or good about anyone. Uh, I'm grounding this in my assessment of the records as as anyone else can can flush out. And so it is it is very is is therefore I put this on the table first and foremost. It is very possible um, and 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 doable to be both a despot and to articulate a pan African vision. Mm. These are not really reconcilable. Again, one is for rhetorical effect. However, one how much be belief there is, and none of us can assess Nkrumah's, you know, um, you know, inner thoughts. None of us, even reading his several biography or autobiographies, right? Um, that's staging for posterity in terms of how I read memoirs and autobiographies, right? Um, I'm interested in what people don't say, and so um, it, it, it is it is rhetorically, you know, doable to talk the ideals of Pan-Africanism, of the United States of Africa, and still be despotic in terms of, 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 of the, the laws enacted under his regime by Nkrumah, right? Those laws, right, are, are not disputable, uh, you know? They're indisputable. Um, those actions against his own allies and colleagues, who he thought was what he claimed to be neo-colonists. But the irony here is that that charge applies to him as well. Because when you look at these key domains, for example, uh, about uh, Ghanaian life, and we talk about context, 1960, you know, um, you know, Nkrumah removes the Queen Elizabeth as the symbolic head of state, right? Um, he's fully in charge of the currency. The currency, the Ghanaian CD, is, is at one-to-one -one with the pound sterling, right? That's the first and last time that would happen. Um, and Nkrumah is fully in charge of the government. That was a moment, you know, to enact or act on those sort of Pan-African ideals, right? Nkrumah does more outside of Ghana than for the people who are in Ghana, right? And this is a charge made by other people, so this is not really unique, but I want to contextualize it in a way that they don't, which is, which is this, is that, again, uh, outside of Ghana, you know, while he's supporting these revolutionaries, they're also acting against him. So, for example, Nigeria accuses him of, of essentially, um, you know, sponsoring what what in today's language would be so-called terrorist groups in, 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 you know, agitating, you know, folks in, in Nigeria. And Nigeria pushes back, you know, by essentially, um, you know, attacking, in some cases, um, deporting Ghanaian nationals. They also push back because they don't want no part of this United States of Africa. So you see what I'm saying? So the very vision is upended by, by his own action, political actions, right? Um, and that may be a cap miscalculation, but these miscalculations, if they are that, they're multiple. You know, trying to persuade his Selassie or trying to persuade, you know, the so-called French community led by Leopold Senghor and, and, and Humphrey Bonnet and others who want nothing to do with this idea. They're more interested in being part of the French community, right? Um, and again, people like, but that just makes, but doesn't that make more point to the, doesn't that help better explain whatever flaws or mistakes he would have made that he was from my perspective, arguing for something righteous against other, even African neo-colonial actors who were not. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so the fact that they didn't want any part of the United States of Africa concept for me just further shows his correctness, certainly vis-a-vis -vis them. Uh, and also the the uh, 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 struggles or barriers or 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 the continuing impact of of, of Western imperialism on his ability to do it, um, and yeah. Anyway, so, so yeah. Well, well, well here's 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 the, here's the thing, and I hear, I hear you and um, Sister Jiba um, clearly. So context is important, but what I'm saying in that context, when he was fully in control of the levers of political power, um, his actions. Right, not his rhetoric, but his actions. Um, they betray the rhetoric. They, but that's what I'm saying. But shouldn't he have been trying to convince these folks to, well, to, to it, join it, him? It, no, here's another here's another view. Um, mm -hmm. if if he was astute as we think he was, then he would have recognized not simply calling them near colonists, but if they are near colonists, why is he trying to essentially uh persuade them by first of all, he calls them out. 
So we, and, and they're already against him. They're plotting against him. So in other words, if I call you a sucker, right, to your face, right, <laughs> and I'm also trying to make you my friend, where is that going to go? So that, that's saying that, that that is a political. But if but okay, but but my only point would be, and then and then I, I probably I want to get I want to let some of these other comments get in. But but yeah. if if my goal mm -hmm. is legitimately something revolutionary, like a Pan African vision, United States of Africa or something like that, whatever, then you're calling me a sucker would, um politically have no impact it, you know in other words it, it wouldn't it would not that would not be the reason why i wouldn't want to to build a united states of africa or that concept with you or any other leader because they called me a name or falsely accused me of some other you know if the in other words if you were saying jared you're not a pan-africanist so you're a sucker then my response wouldn't be well then i'm not going to build with you my response would be you okay well we'll deal with the personal thing later mm -hmm. but to, but because politically, I want the Pan African Union. We got to build. Yeah. So well, guess, what, guess what, Jared? And not yeah. to cut you off, my friend. No, come okay. go ahead. You know, counterintuitively, that that's actually the point. Hmm. Political relationships are built on personal relationships. In other words, it it, it does matter, particularly. And I'm not, I'm not saying this is an African thing. I would never, you know, make that sort of essentialist argument. But there is something to, you know, this fact. And even to, in today's world, right? Whether you know, um, you know, Biden would get along with Angela Merkel, or, or, or you know, or, or um, you know, or Kim Jong Un, or the like, or Xi Jinping, is really a function of their personal relationships, right? And so what I'm saying is that that personal relationship, particularly in African context, is where people, you know, um, will they say, look, you know, remember, many of these states are ran by personal individuals who are about their personal interests. And so they want their calculus is, you know, who is threatening vis-a-vis -vis who I know and can trust personally. Why do you think Nkrumah is become so insular? As, as I think there was a comment there about, you know, assassination attempts. For example, he was in northern Ghana and I think one of his bodyguards or somebody had turned against him. Right. So, yes, he was he was rightfully fearful. But my point is that that insular, you know, you know, reaction is a function of the necessity to build personal relationships because all these people who are who make the government their personal thing that's what we have to get when Humphrey Bonnet you know is in charge of Ivory Coast that's his personal thing when Secretary Ray is in charge of the state that's his personal thing so he views personal relationships they view personal relationships as a precursor as a necessity to political relationships so when he makes these personal attacks, just like Secretary Ray did, Secretary Ray lost a lot of cachet among the other, you know, so-called French-speaking African political figures um, when Guinea decided to go alone and say, no, we don't want to be part of the French community. We want independence. Um, you know, he was alone. Guess why? Because he already, um, you know, ostracized and therefore pushed back against people in Dakar people in, in the other, you know, so-called French-speaking countries. And that's why Secretary Ray, you know, under his rulership, you know, went alone. That was of his, his mis political miscalculation, political naivete by making these attacks. Let's say they are new colonists. That's not the way you build a relationship by calling them out and doing so. Because guess what? They are still attached to the French or the English and got, put, that puts them in a tough spot. Even if they want to wiggle out, even if they want to be, you know, quiet revolutionaries, you don't give them an out. So that is that is that is not only poor political acumen, that's the misreading of the context of the climate, right? That's why when Kuma makes that speech in Addis Ababa, trying to make a one last, you know, heroic attempt to get this thing going, it flops. But by then, people are already calcified in their position against Nkrumah. Hmm. And I'm saying that's the context we also have to pay attention to. Yeah, I, I want to uh, again uh, uh, come back to Bob Porter here, Thomas Thomas Porter. Uh, um, when you're talking about the de the detention of Don Qua, uh, uh, could you talk a little bit about why he was in detention, and then what you think? Uh, maybe a little bit about what what we could be doing now going forward um, to address, maybe you know, to try to uh, correct some of these past mistakes. Sure thing. So um, Don Qua was, was, was not the only one, but he was certainly um, a um, caught up in, in, in the web 
of, of this particular sort of um, detention act, preventive detention act, which is no different in language and in logic than the so-called you know, um, terrorist act or treason act, right? The idea that you're enemy of the state. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, it's sort of a, you know, it, it, it's a, no pun intended, it's a trump card you can pull anytime against those you suspect or deem to be um, suspicious of, 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 of treason or some kind of, you know, fictive crime um, vaguely, you know, um, you know, cloaked <laughs> against the state, right? Against, against the people. Uh, but the arbiter there is, of course, the head of the state, right? He is the state. He embodies the state. And so this Preventive Detention Act, um, that act, you know, came out the year after independence. That's not by happenstance. It was, you know, enacted in 1958, Ghana's independent 1957. And so that Preventive Detention Act essentially gave, you know, uh, Nkrumah, the prime minister, the power to um, detain certain persons up to five years without trial, right? How is that Pan-Africanist? How is that communal? Right? How is that? But, I, but if you're trying to, oh man, I'm just saying, what if. Put it this way, put it I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No go problem, ahead. no problem. Again, I hope you and your folks will have me back on, but. Oh, no, no question, of course. Of course. No, because th this is really healthy. You know, I want to make it clear that I don't stand for or against Nkrumah, right? I want to make that again clear. For any person that I research, I I'm not their lawyer, right? I'm not adjudicating their case. But I think it's important to, again, to, to, to flush out all that we can, again, to draw whatever we can, you know, from, from those experiences. So if, in that spirit, you know, um, that particular act, the year after independence, tells us a lot about, again, the human action that begins to frame. And you're right. Guess what? I sympathize with Nkrumah because that's a tough position to be in. But guess what? When you ask for the spotlight and you get the spotlight, you got to perform. And, and in that performance, in that performance, here's what could have been done as well. A, focus more on that resume for the people of Ghana. B, there are conservative elements in Asante, in Accra, the capital, that's without question. Do, you do what other political savvy people do, right? You 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 see them as thorns, and 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 you, and you may make some 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 minor concessions to say, hey, you know, um, I, I I I see you, I recognize you. Um, we may not agree right now on certain things, but there's a there's a path working together, right? To give you time, right? To to build up that broad support horizontally in society, and then with that. Broad support because you you are literally a man, or in, in other cases, possibly a woman of the people. Then you have that broad wide support, whereby it's not as simple as taking you out, and then of course the movement falls. That's what happens. Once Malcolm is you know is assassinated, what happens to the organization of African community? What happens to the Muslim Mosque Incorporated? The tactic it works. So once Nkuma is ousted in absentia, by the way, he was in Vietnam at the in the moment, sixty six, right? Um, it's because he didn't have any broad horizontal support. That wouldn't have happened if he had broad horizontal support among the people. It happened because he didn't. Because so while he's journeying being a global, you know, third worldsman, and this is not my 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 phrasing, right? While he's while he's global trekking, you know, all over, you know, he's in the former Soviet bloc, you know, he, he's, he's, he's cultivated in this movement with the Communist Party and other folks. Again, he's in Hanoi and he, he's, 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 he's this, you know, the, the, this, this um, global peddler of Pan-Africanism, of global third worldism, whatever that means ultimately. But the neglect is that having a base. So securing Ghana as a base could then become the platform to say, hey, look what we have done. And then growing from there, because guess what? Colonialism didn't start, you know, in mass, in terms of direct. It started in piecemeal, over centuries, right? And then once there was a direct assault in the 19th century, that too was was what was 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 over a period of time, protracted, which means you have to you have to view the converse protractively. You can't view the converse to say, hey, we need to decide in Africa right now. Mm -mm. You have to build the relationships, build 
the infrastructure and then have a proposal and then, you know, but the shock treatment by saying we need to unite right now or else you know, that's it, we're gonna perish. And it may be axiomatically true, but politically and everyday people true, it wasn't. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, in, in, in similar to some of the comments, at least, I, I just, I, I don't know, I guess I'm just struggling with with the, again, the, so for instance, when, when I would read of his, uh, in Krumah's that is attempts to build relationships outside of the continent and outside of the country. It was because he was uh, responding to uh, a lot of the the internal uh, discord, lack of support, lack of resources, uh, uh, and trying to to build partnerships that would protect this fledgling independence. That's not what he was trying to do. Nope. Well, put it this way. Nkrumah spends so much of Ghana's money. Remember, the, the pound sterling and the CD is one-to-one, -one, 1960, right? Ghana, because, of, again, this was one of the most profitable, you know, um, British colonies in West Africa, without question. Coco not only buoyed the colony, it, it had a, basically a surplus. And so at the time of independence, unlike, let's say, the, you know, former Belgian Congo Free State, right, which wasn't free by no means, oxymoronic, um, most Africans, put it this way, man, most African states, you know, from Mali to Malawi, they gained independence broke in debt. That wasn't true for the Gold Coast. That's why Nkrumah was able to what? Send millions of dollars to Secretary in Guinea. And guess what happened? Nkrumah's own ministers of finance said, wait a second, why do that? You haven't secured your own base here in the new republic. Again, yeah, this is a new fledgling infantile republic. Rather than shore it up, he's sending troops and money, the people's money, Jared and folks who are joining us, to support an ideological view that may be right axiomatically, but politically and everyday life, you know, doesn't fit the timing of it. So it doesn't work out in Lumumba's Congo. It doesn't work out among Keita of Mali or Secretary of Guinea. It doesn't work out Addis Ababa, where the organs of African unity, this very weak version, right? A compromise, right? Um, that's there. That's the precursor to the even weaker African Union that we have today. It doesn't work. And so the squandering of that res of that resources puts Ghana for the next two and three decades indebtedness. And the political coups that follow, they're about six, if not seven, after 66, when Krumah is ousted. Each political actor thereafter does the same thing. Claim the people, sloganeering, but the economic turmoil continues. Structural adjustment sets in 1990s, and we know the rest of the story. Neoliberalism sets in. And Krumah sets that up. That domino sets up there. Oh, man. Um, yeah, just a couple comments from sister here. I, yeah, I, I, you know, Maurice Bishop had broad support, met the same fate uh, at the same time. We deeply appreciate the discourse and the push to depersonalize these figures. Um, <laughs> Professor Freya Watt is, is struggling with me as well. <laughs> um, uh, advocating further cementing of balkanization. Um, because again, the for me, so there's two things at least. One, I, I think I agree with, with Professor Freya White here that that it that at least because there's two things I see that at least happening. One, there is when when you referring to him as a despot suggests that that he was intentionally false in his proclamations of of you know, the, the benefits of Pan-Africanism, scientific socialism, United States of Africa. That's one thing. Uh, having those worldviews and then poorly executing them, being a bad statesman, so to speak, is another, is a, is a separate category of criticism, I think, or critique. Um, so, so I'm much more comfortable with he was righteous in attempt and, and poor in execution 
than I am with he was never real to begin with or or not much better than Napoleon or different from Napoleon. Um, and then and then and, and then specifically when you're saying that he shouldn't have you know sent resources to others, I'm thinking again of of that that split between Che and Phil, where Che is saying. I got to go. We got to spread the revolution. Otherwise, Cuba isn't safe. And Fidel is saying, I got to stay here and build up my, I mean, I'm, I'm, I just did my thing. Mm -hmm. We'll help others. We'll send, you know, we'll do what we can. But essentially, I mean, you know, so anyway, mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, uh, um, yes. yeah, go ahead and, yeah, and, and take oh, on oh, any of that, please. I saw, for example, uh, a number of the, um, comments a moment ago. So for example, uh, you mentioned Maurice Bishop. Somebody did anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and by the way, Maurice Bishop, some of his advisors and, and, and close confidant in Grenada uh, were from Ghana, you know. <laughs> uh, in fact, I, I have a, um, a PhD student who I'm working with who's working on that, um, you know, these Ghanaians who were part of these Pan-African mm -hmm. movements, including Grenada, right? So um, definitely, but here is, you know, demography matters that, uh, yeah, Ricky, if I, if I got got it correctly, so yeah, so there is broad, there there, there is a sense of poor, but but Grenada is an island, and that mattered. Ghana is contiguous with these other nation states, you know, for which their borders are are, are connected, and that's why I'm saying the personal relationship with those other political actors, whether you like them or not, it matters. It matters, right? So I'm saying strategically, my friend. So we 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 can agree and disagree, which is all you know, it's all good. But what I'm saying strategically. Being an island, you know, doesn't compare well with being this contiguous state um, that have these various, you know, um, you know, um, you know, factors that, that are working for, in many cases, against you because these borders are sheer and because these borders are porous. It means that unlike Grenada, folks in Ghana got to have to worry about what these these, you know, intrusionary forces that are being sponsored by the French or the British or both. Right. You know, to cross these very porous borders. Right. And I always have to worry about that, even though, you know, Grenada was invaded. So the point is that how we think about these forces operating that are, that are against the interests of, for example, Pan-Africanism or this Pan-African nationalism or this vision of the United States of Africa, those things have to be, I think, tempered by, by the demographics, by geography and by other factors, which I'm not pushing to the side. I'm saying those things are all part of this consideration in the pot. And so... Uh, you can be a despot if by despot we mean someone that has absolute or so-called absolute power, which 960 Kunkuma did in terms of political levers of power, and use them in an oppressive way. That fits the definition. And so you can have both, right? You can have both people who are despotic in terms of behavior and revolutionary in their rhetoric. They're not incompatible. In fact, they, they often go well together. Right, but 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 well, I think somewhat similar to what Brother Shabazz is saying here. You, you're, but you, when you say he's Pan African in his rhetoric, it's suggesting that he's not legitimately trying to be Pan African in his his practice or his his his, or that he's not in his belief. And, no, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that. And I'm okay. but I no, no, go ahead. Is, is clarify my point. My point is, is this: is that you can have both, meaning you can do both. And in many ways, um, not see it as being in conflict. Again, none of us are in, in, the, in the thoughts of Nkrumah, so we can't say what his inner thoughts were. But what we can what we can measure is human action, what he did, and we have records of what he did. And not just he, because I want to make this personal, because it's not personal, but what other characters like him. So I'm saying he's not Napoleon, but he compares in terms of the theme compares with Napoleon. Man, I really struggle with that. I mean, and, and, because, because he wasn't trying to conquer the world for 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 his own. That came own. later. That came later. You, but you're saying that Nkrumah was trying to conquer the world? No, no, no. I'm not saying that. I'm or or Napoleon, like I, well, I, you're saying, Napoleon's desire to conquer the world came later. That came later. But what I'm what I said before, what I'm standing by, which is that uh, I'm not saying that he was or was like Napoleon. I'm saying that the, the theme, taking national sentiments, converting to a movement assuming power-based sentiments representing the people and then turning against those sentiments. That's what I'm saying. So I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to specific nodes on this particular pathway to political power and the use of it. That's what I'm referring to. So I'm saying thematically along those lines, right? There is, but that's not unique either. You, 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 can, you can go to Gaddafi, you can go, you, you can go, you can go to 
Um, Gamal Nasser, whose daughter and Kumar married, you know, for the sake of sort of some sort of vague, you know, uh, African Arab, you know, um, union, which never panned out. So we can go down the list. And what we see is not simply so-called contradiction. What we see, uh, what I'm saying, is the final points and nuances that should force us to recalibrate how we have placed these people in sort of a certain reference. And I'm saying in, in, in traditional, you know, not traditional, but in typical a con fashion, destooling them, that it take them down from the from the high rafters, from the perch, make them ordinary. And when you see them as ordinary people who were in extraordinary times, I think you get a more three dimensional view than the celebrated view that we get, which is I think is flattening them to a certain archetype. That's so in I'm some thinking. ways we're making the same argument, but in different ways. Because my point is, if we if we if we make them more three dimensional, then we have a better appreciation for what it must have been like to be this regular normal man, more or less, in this extraordinary position. That's what I'm saying. That's all I'm so, saying. So, so <laughs> what I mean, but but that's why I'm saying I can't put him in the same context for any purpose with a Napoleon because he's his. His mistakes, you know, in other words, um, whatever repressive acts you're saying that he engaged in were were well, I'm not saying Ghanaians are saying this. Okay, whatever whatever repressive no, acts are saying saying he was was engaged in. Even even including including his own records. Whatever now a lot of his files were burned, somebody took with him to Conakry. Um, but but you know, those files that have survived, and he has a secretary, I think her name was June. Um, you know, and the people at Panaf in London, you know, who publishes in Krumah's books today, to this day, they have access to some of those documents. So his papers say this, his correspondence with Du Bois, for example, which is online at University of UMass uh, with him say this. So what I'm saying is that this is not simply the reading of a person you can agree or disagree with. I'm saying his own words say this. His own actions say this. But his own words and actions also speak to, and this is again where, where I see, uh, you know, Professor Freya Watt and, and Baba Porter in disagreement is that his 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 words and his statements and his, his writings also speak to a geopolitical situation where he is trying to unite a continent, trying to redistribute wealth that it's created, trying to break colonial ties and explain the colonial and neo-colonial ties. It's a question and, and, and how, being, how, huh? how do you know he's trying to do this? In are, the are same, you, in the other, same. In other words, are you really sure? Are you really sure he was trying to do that? Again, he he sent to your your in your own analysis, your own argument. He sent resources to other African liberation struggles. He supported their their freedom. He tried to build with with other anti colonial anti imperial movements around the world. He showed solidarity with them. He chose he didn't side with the West. He go he spoke it in in England and London and told them that the social democracy that they benefit from is based on the colonialism that that Africans suffer. So I mean I've, I you know and then he was targeted by the CIA and the state for removal. So all of that to me suggests that what he was actually doing was trying to live up to those ideals, even if he was imperfect in execution. Yeah, well, um, suggesting and knowing are two different things. So my question to you, what wasn't parochial? I'm saying that um, if, if, and for those who want to push back, it certainly you can, uh, and I appreciate that. We, we, what we do know, right, from, from, from all the evidence we can gather about not just this person, but persons like, you know, him, uh, it, it, is that, again, you can have a rhetorical stance that, that you can believe in and still have actions that go counter to them. Those two are not incompatible. Those things are, are not at odds, right? And there's plenty of examples for that. Take Gaddafi. Who people were raiding before he was, you know, killed by by unified NATO assassinations. Um, by Obama. Yep, yep, yep. Exactly. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, champion of NATO forces, uh, invading and, and, and assassinating Gaddafi. Gaddafi's idea of the United States of Africa, right? Sort of a, a, a um version 2.0, had Gaddafi and Gaddafi's son as as the head of it. You can, you can, you can, you can rhetorically be a Pan-Africanist and believe it. And keyword, I put that in, in bold. And with the conjunction and, still be um, despotic. They're not incompatible. And and for those people who have a hard time with this, 
I think is more so my my guess because I'm not in their bodies or heads is that that's more so a conundrum of the particular emotional attachment people have had to this figure based on the narrative script that I referred to early on than the sort of three dimensional look that I'm trying to um, help us well, get. I, I can only speak for myself beyond my emotional attachment, which I admit based I on the analysis, but I'm saying me, but yeah. what I'm saying is, is that, is that I, I just disagree in that um, beyond the emotional attachment is my, what I think I'm doing by looking at the three dimensional, uh, um, by looking at what actions he did actually try to take and what the response was by the West. Because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, um, all of the imperfections of any of these individuals or groups or movements or ideas has to be, for me, first put up against the fact that the most powerful entities in the world, the West and her allies or, or its allies, were actively and consistently trying to destroy their efforts, assassinating uh, uh, intervening, uh, undercutting currencies and trade agreement, all kinds of stuff. So all of that's happening while this more or less highly intelligent and skilled, but normal man is trying to build and sustain this new freedom and, and, and expand it. But anyway, you, you, I, any, any, I'll let you have the last word on that. I just wanted to clarify, uh, my own, uh, it, it, you know, semi, but I hope beyond emotional stance and response. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing. And I don't disagree with, with, with the part that you laid out. And I think few people that I saw comments flash by, uh, about the sort of geopolitics, but you know, none is a historical. So let's, let's get this straight. Let's get this right. Um, you know, I have books behind me that that's Brian Krumer. So I, I read my Krumers, plural. Um, none of this is, 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 is a historical. Um, what is a historical again is, is catching our feelings when you, there is a particular informed point of view that doesn't sit well within the comfort that you have created around a particular figure. That's what I meant by emotional attachment, right? And I'm not saying you, I'm saying you as in, as in the English version, you all, meaning everyone that's a part of this. Um, and again, you know, in forcing us to think about, you know, a person liking Kumar, right? Uh, in, in this sort of human everyday three-dimensional terms at this extraordinary time and all the context, I agree with the, the contextual part, but here's the point that you were missing that I think we're missing. How are the forces that are quote unquote African thinking about and responding to Nkrumah? We can talk all we want about internationalism of Nkrumah, right? The Pan-Africanism and the West. But the point that you missed that I think we're missing is how did his own people respond to him? That's the point I'm adding here. But was there not Ghanaian support? I mean, were, were all of the people against him? He had no, I mean, and, and, and to what extent was the, the, the waves against him being driven by external forces? That's, that's again, because at least, again, my point about propaganda, we, don't, we can argue about impact, but we can't argue about intent. And the West has been made very clear. It was attempting to disassociate Nkrumah from his people and ideas of Pan-Africanism from uh, uh, his his own people. Uh, so anyway, I mean, he did have some support there. I mean, it, he wasn't entirely without support. And then to the extent he was without support, it was at least to some extent driven by outside forces. Um. Yes and no. Yes, of course, th those those forces are omnipresent. And if if if, if that was a miscalculation in Kuma's part, which which I do argue that that it was, mm -hmm. um, sizing it up, I mean. And I do say in the epilogue that some of these forces were were, were over his prey grade. They, they, they're beyond the efforts of any single person. So uh, I, I get that. Um, but what I'm also saying, you know, that it's not about support. I'm talking about building the infrastructure. That's why I was saying early on in, in our discussion is that the, the sort of you know, in-ground work, not simply for campaigning, that's a different kind of work. That's seasonal work, right? I'm talking about electoral politics. Campaigning is seasonal work, right? Every, some, every, every so few years, canvassing, whatever. Um, that's seasonal work. I'm talking about the ongoing everyday work, right? And so uh, when, when, when he um, you know, is let out of prison and of course he gets his parliament, he's, he's prime minister, uh, he, he, you know, he's, he's not yet the Pan-African figure that we have imagined. That comes a little bit later. 
And there are forces, as I mentioned, Asante is one, and Asante is a very important force because this was well, this was the former empire only a few decades earlier. Asante was officially conquered uh, for all intents and purposes, 1901, 1902, when it became a crown, crown colony of the British. But they were used to their imperial status. This is a local African empire, by the way, right? And I talk about this in the book. I think it'll be worth you know your while to, to if you can, to make it through it, uh, because Kofi Donko was under dual imperialism, one by Asante and another one layered by the British, right? And so um, there, there were um, um, these layers to life that was underappreciated and therefore not addressed. And so on the ground, what Nkrumah did do didn't help him, you know, is actually reify, you know, the church and, and, and Christianity, again, to the, uh, in the opposite direction of most of the populace. Doing the same for Islam. There's an Islamic group that came out of India that's found ground uh, around Sal Palm region on the coast, and then of course it expanded. It's called Ahmadiyya, um, and didn't give the same kind of protection to local cultural forms, spiritualities, and ideas. And this is a man who claimed to support tradition, but undermined so-called chieftaincy, which is a main political structure that was operative. In other words, rather than working with and working through these these things, however you might think about them. You know, he um, essentially sought to abolish them, and that's what I'm saying. Working against those structures in ground, working against the cooperatives, working against the people's cultural form and ideas, even languages, right? And here they made Kiswahili and English the official language. Mm -hmm. That happened. That didn't happen under Nkrumah. Why not? Those are the questions we have to ask. Why wasn't the attention paid to the everyday life ways of the people that he that he claimed, and if there was Pan-Africanism, there wasn't a local form of it that was operative. And I think those are the blind spots we have to also focus on in, in making this three-dimensional read you know, of a person like him. And I'm saying that he compares well to other people in the patterns I've laid out. One quick question before I, before we, that I have to ask before I let you go just came in. Uh, um, how did the Ga and other groups view Nkrumah? In terms, of when you're talking about, I honestly don't know this. I know uh, only recently of some of the dispute between the Ga and the Ashanti in terms of of, of Ghana's history, uh, and much of which I've misunderstood. So I'm just curious about yeah. that. Well, to back up a moment, and this plays into a current recent event that those who follow, you know, Ghanaian politics will be aware of, which is that there's been certain groups making noise in the eastern region. Uh, in the Volta region, excuse me, and these are people who are culture identified as Eve. Um, and so these people uh, essentially, they, they were um, sort of sutured to the Gold Coast, uh, you know, a Ghanaian Republic doing a plebiscite uh, that the British oversaw and didn't give the people a vote. Um, they basically just spliced, basically just spliced what was then British Togoland and added it to the three part colony um, that was the Gold Coast colony. Um, and in doing so, it, it, it didn't allow for any kind of self-determination. So they recently there's been some, there's been some you know, um, outcry, some protesting, and a little bit of skirmishes. I can't say full-scale violence. Um, and that these people push back against is that the very idea of independence that they were not, they didn't have a voice in it, which I think is, is, is very revealing, right? So you have multiple people who have their own particular histories. Asante, the empire, people in the coast and in the north that were essentially the the subjects of the empire, including Kofi Donko's Tetima, you have the the area in the, in the east, um, and then you have the Gaz in the south in Accra, who of course have historically been subjugated to different Akan polities, right? So I'm saying all these, you know, various, um, you know, layered histories um, wasn't appreciated, and so, and again, that's I think is a consequence of putting ideology first rather than putting the people and who they are and all their, you know, and all their stripes, right? Um, putting it into its full perspective, say, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. Mm -mm. It was putting forth ideology first, which I think is a very crucial misstep. All right. Well, listen, everybody. I, you know, um, uh, you know. Unfortunately, I always hate to wrap up these conversations, but but it, you know, can't go on. Unfortunately, forever. <laughs> we got to move on to other things. And I'm actually going to go out here with my family and enjoy some of this snow that's falling over here on the East Coast. Because who knows, we might never see it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
but 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 look, Dr. Connor, do I really appreciate your time? I I, I love the 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 work, the the exchange, the challenge of your of your approach and your and your work and your thought. Uh, uh, definitely enjoy our engagement in in as part of the Black Lash uh, Africana Collective. For real. Uh, that, that that really you are, are as much an inspiration and and originator, you know, for, for of in the first place. So definitely no, that was a group thing. No, 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 no. That was a group thing. Well, a, a com okay. All right. All right. Okay. The African humility. I'm not going to argue with that. I'm not going to keep arguing with you about everything, but, but, you know, uh, I appreciate you being prolific and still taking the time to engage with, with all of us in the communities that you, you, you not only study, but live with, engage and, and want to see thrive. So, Thanks again to you. Thanks again to everybody who joined us and who will see this later. Please, again, en engage the conversation. Keep it going. Uh, Baba Porter, I expect to hear from you soon and have you on uh, 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 to, to discuss all of this and more. And as always, uh, in, in the words of Fred Hampton, to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody. And we'll catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like Live. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like.